Hi guys, welcome back. We are on chapter five or a lady at last. When we left off, um, Mr. Swan had gambled away all of their money that they had earned and she needed to pay the men still. And I think she ended up paying them with pie and food. All right, let's see what this means. November had arrived on the bay, bringing rain and a crisp wind, but I had barely noticed. I had spent the past week sewing and baking, and Jehu joked that my hair smelled like a pie. I was still quite furious with Mr. Swan, though he went to great lengths to be solicitous to me. Our reputation in the oyster business was in ruins. I didn't know how we would ever hire help again. Just think about it. Everyone's going to hear that they didn't actually pay the workers, so who's going to want to go work for them? One cool morning, after finishing the final sleeve of the final shirt, I contemplated my blighted existence. I was full of frustration at the disagreeable men of Shoalwater Bay, Mr. Swan chief among them, and in that moment I resolved that I would have one small comfort for myself. I would have a hot bath or die trying. I had not bathed in warm water since leaving Philadelphia almost a year ago, making do with sticky saltwater baths on the sea voyage, and then bathing in a freezing cold stream since arriving here. After scouring the settlement high and low, I found a large empty wooden cask that had been sawn in half on the beach near where the schooners brought on fresh water. I dragged it around to the side of the cabin and rigged several blankets around it. Then I began the laborious process of heating water over the fire. Pot after pot of steaming water I brought carefully around out of the cabin to fill the cask. Finally, when I was satisfied that the cask was full, I dashed back into the cabin in search of a clean towel and the small bar of lavender soap I had been hoarding. So I'm sure you guys remember from when we read Fever how difficult it was to create a bath. So a cask, I'm assuming, is like a tub of some sort. She has it behind the cabin outside. So that's why she had to put up blankets around it to have some privacy. And then back and forth, heat the water, pour it in. Go heat water, pour it in. That's, that's a, big, a big task. As I rounded the corner, towel in hand, I heard the sound of men talking excitedly. I yanked back the blanket screen to see several bare-chested men huddled around the cask. What are you doing? I demanded. One of the men blushed slightly. Our laundry, of a, a course. I ran over to the cask and peered inside. <laughs> Filthy shirts swam in the now gray, murky water. Oh my God. They're doing their dirty clothes in it. Oh my gosh, that was my bath. The men looked a little puzzled. One of them spoke up. Since you said you wouldn't do our laundry no more, ma'am, we just figured we'd have to do it ourselves. The water was just sitting here, wasting away. It was not wasting away. I heard the familiar sound of spitting. Gow, Mr. Russell said, milking bucket in one hand and stool in the other. You gotta start milking Burton. These men just stole my bath water, I exploded at him, and now you want me to milk your cow? Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the thieving men slink away. Mr. Russell ignored my remark completely. Gal, I can't be here all the time. If I go away, someone's got to take care of Burton. I put my hands on my hips. While I had certainly performed more disgusting chores than milking a cow, I despised the beast almost as much as the man. Burton the cow had been responsible for eating my entire wardrobe when I'd first arrived on the bay. I heard the cow mooing loudly in the distance, and Mr. Russell crook, crooked his finger for me to follow him. The cow was situated in a roofed stall not far from the cabin. The beast snapped her tail as if she were as irritated at the thought that of my milking her. Mr. Russell patted the cow's rump gently, murmured soothing words. Now, gal, pull firmly, but go nice and easy. Birdie's real sensitive. I stared at the cow dubiously. All right, then, you take a go at it, gal. Mr. Russell said, ain't nothing to be afraid of. I drew myself up. I am most certainly not afraid of a cow. Then go on. He chal his challenge hung in the air. I was Miss Jane Peck of Philadelphia. I was a proper young lady. I could organize a party for 50. I could certainly milk a cow. I sat down on the stool and gingerly positioned the bucket. The cow swung her head around and glared at me. I took a deep breath and then I grabbed the teat firmly. The cow bellowed and a spray of milk rained on my bosom. 
I let go of the teat, and in the next moment, I felt a distinct sharp pain in my elbow as the cow kicked outward. The beast lunged at my head, snagging a swath of my hair in her teeth, tugging hard. I didn't know the cow could bite on your hair and pull your hair. Ow! I smacked the cow furiously and scrambled away, cradling my injured arm. Ya darn gal, I told you to go nice and gentle, Mr. Russell grizzled, hovering over the agitated cow. You told me to pull firmly. Ya stupid useless gal, ya scared my birdie. The cow let out an indignant bellow. That beast tried to kill me, I shot back. I held up my throbbing elbow. I felt the swish of skirts brushed against my back and looked up startled. A rosy-cheeked feminine face stared down at me with bemusement dark tendrils escaping from a smooth bonnet. She looked to be about 20 or perhaps 21 and was as pretty as one of those drawings in Godey's ladies book. Mr. Swan was standing next to the woman, his flushed cheeks glowing with pleasure. This is Mrs. Frank Jane. She and her husband have only just arrived, so I brought her straight here. They traveled overland all the way from Ohio, Mr. Swan said, as if it bestowing a, as if bestowing a present. How do you do, Miss Peck, the young woman said in a cultivated voice. She was tidily outfitted in neat, a neat dress of yellow calico, a matching bonnet, and cream leather gloves. Although her clothes were not, fan, were not fancy dress, they were certainly of a nice cut. I was abruptly, painfully aware that my skirts were covered with mud. My bodice soaked with milk's cow, cow's milk, and my hair tumbled down around my shoulders in a tangled heap. My, what unusual grass, she said, raising a curious arched eyebrow. Is it peculiar to the region? Grass, Mr. Swan asked, rubbing his beard thoughtfully. We followed her line of vision and saw that the cow was chomping on something long and red, a bayful, a baleful expression on her face. So the cow's chewing on something long and red. That's not grass. I put a tentative hand up to my head and felt a patch of skin where hair should have been. Oh my gosh. Mr. Russell snorted. Mr. and Mrs. Frink had been married a little over a year. They had traveled in a wagon train, <clears throat> she informed me. She was eager to tell me about their travel plans. I cannot believe this girl's luck. She takes all that time getting the bath ready and then they wash their clothes in it. She tried to milk the cow and he tears out a chunk of her hair. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, it's just funny. Her husband had heard from a cousin that the area was booming, and as they had missed the gold rush, he was very eager that they try their luck on the bay. He had grand ideas of opening a hotel. Mrs. Frank was very fond of Mr. Frank, but men, for all their good intentions, were not as sensible as women, were they? After all, she had been the one to round up their horses when they'd spooked in Illinois, and it had been her negotiations with that just disreputable ferryman that had gotten them across the river in Missouri. And then, of course, it had been her good suggestion to use the metal bits from the pickle barrel to mend the spare wheel when it had broken near the Snake River. I learned all this as I changed into clean clothes behind the shabby blanket screen that served as a dressing area of sorts. Mrs. Frink had barely ceased speaking since entering the cabin. Mr. Swan had left her with me to provide a lady's hospitality while he went off to show her husband our begoning settlement. Not sure about that word, sorry. But Mrs. Frink had done most of the entertaining so far. I tried to attend her, but was distracted by thoughts of how I must appear next to this new arrival. While my dresses were of serviceable calico, they were not as fashionable as Mrs. Frink's. I didn't even own a pair of gloves anymore, and my bonnet was quite sad looking, not to mention my shoes were ill-fitting boys' boots. I felt the same way I used to feel when Sally Biddle walked into a room. Really, it all went back to Sally Biddle. Picture a perfect girl with golden curls, a tiny waist, and all the best connections. Add to that an uncanny ability to make one cry with a single word, and that is Sally Biddle. Just thinking about her made all the misery come rushing back. How she used to say that my hair resembled a squirrel's nest and whisper that I was plump and belittle our house on Walnut Street saying it looked a li like a little stable. Well, and let's not forget the stuff she said about her mom. Perhaps the lone advantage of Shoalwater Bay was that it was situated a continent away from Sally Biddle in Philadelphia. Mrs. Frink continued chatting from the other side of the curtain, 
But Mr. Frank, I said, I can't imagine that there will be much call for a hotel here on the frontier. I fingered the newly bald patch on the side of my head. It was the size of a silver dollar. So that would be a silver dollars larger than a quarter. Ugh, blasted cow. There was no helping it. I tugged on my worn bonnet and came around the curtain in a determined fashion. I was not about to let this woman intimidate me the way Sally Biddle had in the past. What a charming dress, Mrs. Frank exclaimed. Such a lovely print. Thank you, I said cautiously. I sewed it myself. How perfectly clever of you. Perhaps you would consider sewing a dress for me. I looked blankly at her immaculate dress. Oh, she said with a self-conscious laugh, this is the only decent dress I have left. The rest were all quite ruined on the trail. This only survived because I packed it away. I smiled at her. I'd be happy to. I felt something tight in my chest loosen. She wasn't like Sally Biddle at all. She was more like what I imagined an older sister would be. I poured her a cup of coffee and brought the sugar and milk to the table. It reminded me of Miss Heppelwhite's, the soothing ritual of pouring tea. She clapped her hands happily. You use tin too, I see. Tin? Tin cups, my dear. They're ever so practical, she lowered her voice. I used our good china on the first week on the journey, but I grew so worried about breaking something that I packed it away and ado adopted the pioneer method of using tin plates and cups. It's ever so much more practical. She gave an exaggerated sigh. And then, of course, our box of china fell out of our wagon during a stampede of buffalo somewhere back along the Platte River. So I have little choice now. I jumped out of the wagon after it and tried to shoo away the dratted animals with a broom, but I declare that they are the stupidest animals that I've ever lived. And the china was all smashed to bits except for the butter dish, which somehow lodged itself into a buffalo chip. Okay, a buffalo chip is a, it's buffalo poop. <laughs> so I don't think I'd want that butter dish anymore. The image of proper Mrs. Fink brandishing a broom at stampeding buffalo in order to rescue her china was too much. I couldn't help it. I burst out laughing. I think I had not laughed since receiving word of Papa's death, and it felt so good, like a sneeze after being tickled. Mrs. Frink looked affronted for a brief moment, then giggled herself. Mr. Frink was very vexed with me for jumping off the wagon, she confided. But Mr. Frink, I said, good china is worth being trampled over. At least you rescued the butter dish, I said, wiping away a tear. She nodded seriously and giggled. Yes, although I must confess, I have no desire to use it. I cannot seem to rid myself of the sight of it lodged in manure. After we finished our coffee, I offered to give Mrs. Frink a, t a tour. At last, another lady. I had so many questions for her. It is so wonderful to be back in civilization, Mrs. Frink declared happily. I bit my tongue. The settlement was hardly civilization, unless you considered a pack of unwashed men who debated the finer points of chewing tobacco good company. She turned to me. I should very much like to meet the other ladies. Well, I hedged as we stood on the porch surveying the cabins and tents that dotted the landscape. I'm rather afraid that I am the only young lady present. One elegant eyebrow raised slightly. I see. I rushed to reassure, but the Chinook women are very kind, and quite a few speak English. They live that way, I said, pointing at the stream. Chinook, do you mean Indians? I nodded. I see, she said again, an inscrutable expression on her face. And who exactly lives in this cabin? Mrs. Frank asked, wrinkling her small nose. I twisted my hands. For all her stories of the trail, Mrs. Frank seemed a very proper sort of lady. Her gloves were spotless. I imagined she would be horrified to learn that I had been living unchaperoned in a cabin with assorted men these many past months. It would be utterly inappropriate behavior for a respectable young lady under ordinary circumstances. I swallowed hard. Well, myself and Mr. Russell and Mr. Swan and sometimes Caruso and, and, and sometimes whatever men are passing through. I finished with an awkward rush. She eyed the cabin coolly. My, but... What a luxury to have a proper roof over one's head, she said with real longing. My mouth fell open. I have been sleeping under the stars or in our wagon for the past six months. The canvas covering our wagon is very in a very sad state, I fear. I was taken aback by her candor. Although, she said, her voice softening, I must confess to growing accustomed to falling asleep with stars over my head. The most beautiful sight I've ever seen was when I lay on the plains at night, the st starry sky stretching above us like a quilt. She blinked and laughed. Of course, I was worried to death that Indians would steal our horses. Did they? Once, 
but they let us spy them back. She eyed the well-worn trail leading away from the cabin. Shall we meet your neighbors? Of course, I said, right this way. So do you think, Miss Peck, that there will be much call for a hotel out here? She asked in a serious voice, as if she truly valued my opinion. There are many men around here who would be happy for a proper bed and a cooked meal. A hotel might be quite popular, actually. I imagine I'd be the first to stay there, especially if there were a bathtub. She laughed, a bright, tinkly laugh that made me smile. We are going to be such great friends, Miss Peck. I just know it. We followed the stream down past a small, neat building with a cedar plank roof. A cross jutted from the ceiling. That is Father Joseph Chapel. He's a French Catholic missionary. He came on the same boat I did. Is he having much success spreading the faith? I'm afraid not, I said. Poor man, she grinned at me impishly. But then again, who likes to be told what to do, even by a man of the cloth? We rounded a bend in the trail and entered the large grassy clearing where the huge cedar lodges of Chief Toke's village were clustered. Are those the Indians? Miss Fring asked. I looked about. Nearby, chopping a pile of firewood with axes, was a group of men I had hired to harvest the oysters, oysters, all wearing identical shirts. Well, yes, I said. How very interesting, she said. I thought they'd be more like the Indians on the trail, but here they are, all dressed up like us. Sudi came running straight at me, chattering happily and dragging her doll. Boston Jean, Boston Jean, Sudi yelled. Is this your sister? She looks just like you, except your hair is prettier, but I like her dress better. <laughs> Little kids always say the truth, right? Mrs. Frink and I looked at each other embarrassed. Sudi, I said, trying to slow the rush of words. This is Mrs. Frink. What a charming child, Mrs. Frink exclaimed. Is that a doll you have there? Sudi held out her doll for inspection. Boss and Jane made my dolly a new dress, she informed her importantly. And it's quite a lovely dress too, Mrs. Frink com complimented. And I smiled at the woman for her kindness. Sudi is Chief Toke's daughter, I said. He is the chief or taille of this village. A chief, Mrs. Frink said, impressed. That's right, Sudi said proudly, because he is the most rich. Sudi, do you know where your father is? I asked. She pressed her lips together for a minute and then said, he is with Mr. Russell, Mr. Swan, and some other man. I don't like Mr. Russell very much, she informed Mrs. Frink. He has a cow that keeps us up all night sometimes. Was that the gentleman with whom you were milking the cow when I arrived? Mrs. Frink asked. Yes, he was the first pioneer to come here. I was preparing to launch into an explanation of Mr. Russell's business and character when Mr. Swan, Mr. Russell, and a man who I supposed must be Mr. Frink, came sauntering over to where we stood. Ah, Jane, there you are, capital, Mr. Swan announced. Miss Peck has been very kindly giving me a tour, Mrs. Frink said, patting the man on his arm. Miss Peck, may I introduce my husband, Mr. Frink? Mr. Frink, who in distinct contrast to his wife, looked like he had just spent six months on the trail in his worn boots and dirty shirt, shook my hand. Mrs. Frink turned her attention to Mr. Russell. Miss Peck tells me you were the first pioneer in the area, Mr. Russell. First but not last, ma'am. We're real pleased to have you here. To my utter astonishment, Mr. Russell removed his hat and smoothed back his hair. We don't get too many ladies out this way. What about me? I was a lady. He had never once in all my time on Shoalwater Bay removed his hat because of my presence. We're very happy to be here, Mrs. Frink replied with a gay smile. That's a real pretty dress you're wearing, if you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Russell added, blushing furiously. Why, Miss Peck, you didn't tell me what a charming man Mr. Russell was, Miss Frink said with a wide smile, extending her arm to him. Mr. Russell took it gallantly and led her toward the cabin. All I could do was stare. <laughs> oh my gosh. He has been mean to her the whole time, spitting at her feet. Oh my gosh. And now he's like all gentlemen with this lady. Wow. Okay. Well, until our next chapter. And I, I guess my question is, do we trust Mrs. Fink? I don't know. I don't know if I trust her. She's being really nice, but... Um, with Jane's luck, it just seems like everything goes wrong. So I have a little bit of suspicions on Mrs. Frank. So I wonder if you do. Bye.